Well, good evening and welcome to a special video on Polar Review. We're kind of at the halfway point for our Polar uh, chapter and I thought tonight was a great night to kind of tap the brakes and just take a back, uh, look back and reflect on what we've seen so far in this chapter. Number one tonight, I want to talk about finding multiple representations of a single point in polar form. Um, I think this is a practice that's still going to benefit us. Uh, and it's going to really uh, launch us into doing area, especially we've talked about when we do get to area, the hardest thing is getting the bounds on the integral. So multiple representation of a single point, we're going to look at that. Uh, number two is we're just going to review graphing a polar function. And, um, you know, if we're dealing with a limicon with an inner loop, you know, getting the final picture on our paper is important. But it's just as important to know... Um, you know, be able, able to find specific points on that graph and maybe restrict the domain and tweak it that way. And the third thing we'll review is, is how to find the slope of a particular point on a polar curve and, and uh, the challenges that come with that. And I'm even going to add a fourth one. Uh, just before the video ends, we're going to do an intro into polar area and just really talk about shading the correct region tonight just to kind of give us a little taste. So that's where we're heading tonight, and let's go ahead and jump in. First things first, we don't want to go any further uh, bef without having a discussion about the big four. And basically, these are the um, relationships that are going to help us translate an equation from polar to rectangular or vice versa. So go ahead, hit pause, give yourself uh, 15, 20 seconds, and write these down. In no particular order, I had x equals r cosine of theta, y equals r times the sine of theta. Those, both those relationships will be really important when we do get to slope again. Uh, we know that uh, r is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared, and that's according to the Pythagorean theorem. And that the tangent of y is equal to, or tangent of theta is equal to y over x. Or we could even say theta is equal to inverse tangent of y divided by x, however you want to say it. Before I throw a specific point at us to try to create multiple representations of, let's um, just practice our angles and understanding equivalent rotations that are going to take us to the same destination. Um, for instance, um, going counterclockwise pi over 3 would be equivalent, let's say pi over 3 counterclockwise, that'd be equivalent to going how many radians clockwise. So I'm going to try to go the opposite direction. I'm going to start here and I'm going to go clockwise and I'm going to go until I hit right here. How many radians is that? Hopefully you're saying 5 pi over 3. Okay. In other words, if, um, if I added these two angles together, what would they equal? You guessed it, 2 pi. They make up one complete revolution added together. All right, let's try a different one. Um, let's say I went clockwise or, I'm sorry, counterclockwise, 3 pi over 4. So I want to go maybe to here. Now, if I went the other direction, how many radians would that be clockwise? Let's see. I want to start here, and I'm going to go the opposite direction. That would be how many? That would be his reflection there, 5 pi over 4. Again, the, the secret trick there is that added together, they make 2 pi. So hopefully you feel a little more comfortable about those. Let's go ahead, and I'll erase some of my marks. And what I want to have you guys try to do on your own is come up with three alternative points that are equivalent to 3 comma 7 pi over 6. So just to make sure we're all starting on the same page, I would rotate, um, let's see, 7 pi over 6, which is going to take me to right here. It's going to land me right there. I want to come up with three other points that are going to take me to the same final destination. Good luck. The first one I came up with was just, um, I said, what if I just rotated clockwise? And this would be a clockwise rotation of 5 pi over 6. So, and in that case, my angle would, or my radius would stay positive 3. I'm just going to negate my angle to show that I went clockwise, okay? Um, the, the second one I ended up with, I said, what if I, what if I rotated pi over 6, stopped right there, but then I would then have to make my radius a negative 3, and I would just walk straight across this radial line until I landed at my final destination. So that's a negative 3 for my r, but a positive pi over 6 for my angle because notice I went clockwise, or I'm sorry, counterclockwise to get up to pi over 6. And my third one that I did um, was I, I tried to do one without adding 2 pi or subtracting 2 pi to the angle because I think we're already really good at that, was I said, what if I rotate 
um, negative 11 pi over 6, okay? And I would then have to, again, walk right across that radial line to get to where I want to land, so then it would be a negative 3 that way. So I hope that those um, all make sense. Okay, the first graph that I want to take a stab at is r equals 3 sine of theta, and we have so shown some drastic improvements in this area of our polar work. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is what are your expectations? Hopefully we've done enough of these now that you feel comfortable saying I expect to see a circle. And just to confirm that, I'm going to work on my rectangular graph here, and here's the sine curve. And what I've really, what we've talked about is we probably only need to go to pi on these to figure out, you know, to complete that first revolution. We'll say there's pi over 2. So what I'm going to say is here's point A, and that translates to the pole. Um, here's point B, and that's pi over 2 comma 1. So that's going to take me right here. That would be my point B. And we'll say point C is right there at pi, which, because we're touching the x-axis, we're going to say that our r value is 0, so it took me back to the pole, and I made this type of movement right here. So it just came up with a circle. Of course, if I change the sine to cosine, it's still a circle. It's just now symmetric with respect to the x-axis instead. Um, oh, of course, hopefully you caught this here before I did. I did have an amplitude of 3, so like point B here would have a height of 3. So I should go up to here. That's going to give me a much bigger circle with a little more girth and body to it. All right. Um, what if I wanted to graph r equals 2 and there was no sine or cosine attached with it? Then it would just simply be um, symmetric with the, the pole and it would just follow that line right there. All right, the next one I want to try is r equals 1 minus 2 sine of theta. Uh, we've talked about um, how if this coefficient's a little bit bigger, we call this our b value. If it's a little bit bigger than our a value, we're expecting a limicon with an inner loop. So we've got that idea branded into our minds. And let's see, because of the 1 was positive, I'm going to have a vertical shift upward 1 unit. We'll, note it, we'll make a note of where pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi are. And uh, what's this negative going to do for us? It's going to reflect our sine curve upside down. So it's going to still start here, but then by pi over 2, it's going to drop two units below that dotted line. And then at pi, there will be a so-called uh, root, and I'll use that word loosely in quotations. And then at 3 pi over 2, we're going to be two units above the uh, dotted line, and then we'll finish right on that dotted line. Now, how tall is that highest point? Well, let's see. It's going to be three units, I believe, tall. That'll be important to know, and this lowest one's negative 1. So let's see if we can go ahead and translate these points. The first one, we've got an r value of 1. Okay, so there's point A. Then at pi over 2, we've got, to, we've got a radius of negative 1, which, let me show you. So here I'm thinking pi over 2, but I've got to do negative 1, so I'm going to land right there. So somewhere in between those points, I hit the pole. Um, I didn't do a great job of drawing that one, but right here... At pi over 6, we'll call this pi over 6, that's when we cross the pole. So I should never cross this radial line right here. I should never get higher than that line if I do this right. So I'm just going to come up and through just like that. And then what's going to happen is at 5 pi over 6, I've looped myself back to that pole. And then at pi, we've got to hit 1. It's going to be right there. Again, I want to stay under the 5 pi over 6 if I can. Looks like I was fairly successful there. 3 pi over 2, I need to be at 3. Going to give myself a big swoop there, and then we'll go back to 2 pi. So that's what our limicon with an inner loop is. Now, of course, I was operating under the assumption that my domain is 0 to 2 pi. If they wanted to shrink that on us, like let's say they wanted to go from, let's say, pi over 2 to pi, what would it look like? What would we have to erase? I would basically start right here. And then I would end right here. So all I would end up seeing is this little section right in there. Uh, when we first started discussing slope, our, um, we encountered a lot of obstacles. But uh, just remember this. Slope, no matter what, is always rise divided by run. Rise is our change in y divided by our change in x. And uh, we've always liked to use the notation dy over dx. So now, because we're speaking in polars, my dy is actually going to be 
the derivative of y with respect to theta divided by the derivative of x with respect to theta. Now, just based on your uh, knowledge of complex fractions, you could see how those d thetas would cancel out and simplify to just dy dx. Now, how do we calculate that? Well, we already know that y is equal to r sine of theta, and we already know that x is equal to r cosine of theta. So we need to derive both of those with respect to theta. And that's where we ended up using the product rule, and we got something really long. So go ahead, just hit pause, and take 15 seconds to see if you can crank out that formula. Okay, very good. Here's what my product rule produced for me. Hopefully you got the same thing. Uh, make sure we've got that negative sign on that uh, first part of our denominator. A couple of bear traps we want to make sure we're ready for is they may just ask us to find um, when a particular curve has horizontal tangent lines. And what's special about all horizontal lines is that they have a slope of zero, which means we're just going to set um, our dy d theta equal to zero. In other words, we're just going to set the numerator equal to zero, and we're going to totally disregard the denominator. Or vice versa, they could ask us to find the location of all the vertical tangent lines. And the one thing that all vertical lines have in common is that their slope is undefined. And in this case, that would imply that dx d theta is equal to zero. In other words, we would disregard the numerator and simply set the denominator equal to zero. To practice calculating the slope, I want to go back and use one of the curves that we just drew, 1 minus 2 sine of theta. And what I want to do is I want to try to find the slope at the moment when theta equals pi over 6. And so let's recall that graph that we made. We said we were going to start at 1, and then we were going to hit the pole right at pi over 6. So that's actually, this is the point that I want right there. And I'm going to try to stay under the radial line, pi over 6. Eh, eh, did okay, I guess. Um, and then it would continue on further, but I'm not even going to really worry about the rest of the graph because I want to focus on, on this point and what the tangent line looks like there. And we would definitely agree that the slope is going to be a positive something right there. So if, obviously if we get a negative answer, we need to backtrack and uh, figure out what went wrong. So what I want you to do right now is just to uh, take the formula that we just talked about and get everything plugged in. You know, plug in um, this 1 minus 2 sine of theta for your r. We'll plug in your dr d theta, uh, and we'll go from there, and we'll see if we get the same answer. Okay, just a quick check before we go too far. Um, you'll notice here's my r expression, my 1 minus 2 sine of theta. The only thing I left blank was my dr d theta. Um, if I derive this expression right here with respect to theta, we are going to get negative 2 cosine of theta. So I'm just going to plop that bear back in there. Now the only thing left to do is to take our pi over 6 and substitute it for every single theta that we see. And I think we're about to stumble upon some good news. So let's go ahead and crank this bear out and see if we get the same numerical answer. When I plugged mine in, this entire expression right here turned out to be a zero, which wipes out this entire half. Same thing happens down here. So really all I have to do is worry about this rascal here and this expression here. By the time I was all said and done, I got radical 3 divided by 3 for my slope. Hopefully you guys can confirm that, and we'll keep our fingers crossed that I didn't make a careless mistake. So uh, if you do have something different, double check your work, and um, if it still comes out to be the same, then we'll, we'll compare uh, tomorrow in class. All right, before we wrap up tonight's video, I want to do a brief intro to our polar areas that uh, are going to consume us for the rest of the week. Um, and I want to shade in the region that's bounded by 4 sine of theta, theta equals pi over 6, and theta equals pi, or 7 pi over 12 here. And uh, it's just a radically different way of thinking about our shaded region compared to what we did with um, the rectangular coordinates where everything was always upper minus lower or right minus left and so forth. And so we really want to tip that upside down. And um, so 4 sine of theta is simply going to be a circle uh, with a diameter of 4 and a radius of 2. And so I think it's going to take me right, I'm going to start at the pole, of course, and I'm going to swoop out, and we get ourselves a nice circle. All right, now let's talk about pi over 6. I want you to follow that radial line, start at the pole, and follow that radial line at pi over 6, okay? And we'll put a dot right there. So we're starting right there. And then we're going to rotate clockwise until we hit 7 pi over 12. So again, start at the pole and follow this line up to 7 pi over 12. 
Now, as far as the shading goes, and, I, and I'm going to be a pain in the butt on this one a little bit, is I don't want you to just, you know, just start scribbling that area in, okay? Because I, I don't want to think, you know, upper minus lower anymore. What I want to start thinking is like a wiper blade, okay? Everything's like a wiper blade. We're starting with this radial line, and we're going to start to rotate counterclockwise. And this is how we're going to always shade our regions in. It's just like this, okay, until we hit that second radial line. And that's what I consider a shaded region. Um, and basically, we would, we're going to learn how to set up an integral whose lower bound is pi over 6 and whose upper bound would be 7 pi over 12. And there's some other fancy things that go with it, but that'll get us started. For our final one in the night, I want us to think about the curve r equals 2 plus 2 cosine of theta. And it's also going to be bounded by theta equals pi over 3, as well as theta equals 3 pi over 2. So this is an interesting region to look at. First things first, what do you expect from this graph right here? Um, because our A value and our B value are equivalent, I'm expecting a cardioid with that very sharp um, dimple-like behavior right at the pole. Even if, and if you, this helps, you know, don't be afraid to crank out a quick sketch of that function whose highest point is at 4. And so that particular curve is going to start here at 4. By the time we hit pi over 2, it's going to have a height of 2. Back to the pole at pi. Um, 3 pi over 2 is going to have a height of 2. And then back. So we're going to get something like this. In that neighborhood where we're pretty sharp there at the pole. So here's what we got to do next. Let's start with a radial line at pi over 3. Right along here. And then I'm going to finish at 3 pi over 2, which would be straight down right there. And again, I'm very particular about the shading. That's the one thing I want to do tonight is it's not just scribbling up and down and just filling in that space any way that we want. It's about being very precise here and seeing the wiper blade start at pi over 3 and rotate counterclockwise. Right there is pi over 2. Continue to go clockwise. Boom, boom, boom. And now the wiper blades um, are going to start there and then there, and you can see them rotating, and it's just a beautiful process. And that's what we want to challenge ourselves is to get into this mindset of seeing the, where the wiper blade starts, seeing where it ends, and seeing it rotate counterclockwise as it moves from start to finish. So good luck with all the polars. We'll see you tomorrow for a big kickoff.